Uh, let's get started here. Wow, I haven't got to preach about 25 after for a good while. I like his time. I like his time frame right here. All right. Um, I started uh, last week after Ron Wick got to preaching. Wasn't Ron good last week? Somebody said, I can't believe, hey, amen. Uh, he's so quiet. Sometimes he's right next to me. And I say, Ron, speak up. Uh, he's so quiet. But when that anointing gets on him, I'm telling you. First time I saw him preach, I went, where'd he come from? So, uh, and he's so blessed. And I shared Sunday, I shared uh, Sunday uh, out of that spontaneous offering. Uh, we, we were able to uh, write him a check for he left for $2,800. And another $100 came in after that. So that's 29, amen. So uh, that's gonna put him a long way in that instrument, uh, not instrument, that uh, flight instruction thing. And he's a wonderful pilot. I enjoy flying with him. And uh, he's helped me a lot. Uh, matter of fact, Ron's the first one put me in the left seat flying an airplane. And uh, he spent a lot of time with me. And so... Uh, so we're thankful for it. I know he knows how to get people out of trouble because he got me out of trouble. But he didn't know we were going to get into trouble. So we were flying. He had a 152. It's a little two-seater. And we were up over Lake Palestine flying out of Tyler, Texas. I was going to, when I got done with that revival, I was going to come back here and find a flight instructor at Phillipsburg. And I bought all of my flight manuals there, my, uh, my starter kit for private pilot. And we were flying it, we were flying, you know, flying into the night. I mean, just doing landing after landing. And, and, uh, but we were up, he said, I'm gonna show you what a stall is. All right, well, let's get after it. So, you know, you're a little nervous thinking about stalling, uh, but a stall is not where the motor stops. That's just where you just lose lift. Uh, it stalls out and you, you drop. So you have to know how to recover from it because when an airplane goes into a stall, you got to know how to get out of it. The closer you are to the ground, uh, the more detriment it could be. So, out, so altitude is your friend or your good attitude is your friend. I like to preach those together. So anyway, we're over Lake Palestine and we climbed about, uh, I don't know, we're about 3,500 feet, 4,000 feet. And he says, there's two kinds of stalls. There's a power on stall where you have power to simulate takeoff. And there's a power off stall, simulate landing. And so that little airplane he has, I did not know it, but if you stall it and let it go, it'll fly on its own. You're going to spin, but it'll come out on its own. But I didn't know that. I, did, I didn't know anything about it. And so he said, now the airplane, when it stalls, just... Uh, lower the nose and give it power. So he tries to, he showed me how to do it. But then when you're doing it, so I'm up there and you know, the stall is you, you pull the power off, you lift your nose up and the wings, the, the air don't go over the wings right. So the, the airplane's nose high like that and then I'll start shaking and next thing you know, it'll just fall off like that or something or whichever way and you got to catch it. Well, I'm just, I've never been in one. So what I did, what they called cross controlled. He didn't know what was going to happen. So I turned my aileron the wrong way and that thing went down this way and went into a spiral like. I was pinned against the door. I could see the ground. The first thought hit my mind was, Angel's gonna kill me. <laughs> That's the first thought hit my mind. Now he knows. <laughs> That's the... She wouldn't get the chance, would she? So I said, Ron, can you save it? He said, if you get, every, you get your foot off the rudder, I didn't know it was on it, you know, by, just by pressure, and uh, he got it out of that. So I said, you know, I think you'll make a good flight instructor one day uh, because you uh, just saved. Uh, now, if we let go of it, it came on its own, he said, but you don't want to take a chance that it doesn't. You know, that's a bad place to figure out. Let's just see if it really works. That's just a bad time to try to figure out aerodynamics. Uh, so anyway, uh, so when I came back and started flight training, see when you give me too early, I can talk a little bit before I get serious. So I came back to Phillipsburg and got a flight instructor and, and uh, we uh, started off, you know, with basics. He said, now tomorrow we're going to do stalls. Oh man, my stomach got sick, man. I was like some of you about calling sick. And uh, I was nervous all night, nervous all night. And... Uh, he says, uh, what's wrong? I said, I'm just a little apprehensive. He says, oh, they're so benign. I'm thinking, you haven't been in what I was in. <laughs> and I didn't know to tell him or not. 
so I finally broke down and told him because I was really apprehensive about it. And so he says, no, he says, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll get through it. And uh, so we got up there and the first one I put into, you know, it's almost like close your eyes and grit your teeth. Ugh. But anyway, uh, we got through it. Then you get on doing it. The next thing you know, you're stalling it, smiling and recovering it within 50 feet and everything's all fine. But that first one, Ron Witt, really was my hero. And so I'm thanking God for his ability to do what he does. And this church is going to play a great role in helping him help missionaries and ministers keep this current season, the things that they have when they need it. Amen. All right. Uh, so after he got done with his preaching and we were able to bless him that night, I got up and I started something that I started calling, uh, how did Jesus heal? How did Jesus heal? You know, I made a statement. People say, oh, I, I want to be like Jesus. And uh, when I made that statement, I said this. A lot of people say that I want to be like Jesus, referring to I want to raise the dead. I want to lay hands on the sick. I want to see the blinded eye open. I want to see the captive set free. That's what they mean. But then I showed you stories about when Jesus told the disciples, get into the ship and go to the other side. Even after preaching all day, he didn't just one place he was in the ship asleep on a pillow. But that particular time after being all day with the people and sending the people away. If you remember, if you were here, you can go back and listen to the audios. It said he went to the mountain to pray. He rose up early to pray. He didn't just go around and do miracles. He spent time with the father. So there's different things that Jesus did to get the results that he got. And so uh, uh, that's what we must understand. If we want to see what he saw, if we want to be able to do what he did and get the results that he had, maybe we ought to follow the pattern that he used. That is the whole issue. He said, the works that I do shall you do and greater works than he shall you do. Now we know Jesus, a man with, with the spirit of God without measure, we as an individual are not going to do the exact things that he did. The Bible said if, we did ever, if everything he did and said was recorded, there wouldn't be enough volumes in heaven to contain it. So we know that he did more, and, and uh, then the truth is, Shannon and I have talked about it, and uh, we've heard other people preach about it, only about 30 days of miracles recorded in the Gospels. 30 days of miracles are recorded. So I mentioned that la last week. So you're talking about in three years of just miracle act of ministry, they only picked out about 30 days worth of miracles. I mean, where's all the others? Was, did he just sit down and uh, drink coffee and tell stories with the boys or what did he do? No, he was doing the works of the father. We just didn't record them all. We didn't record them. So me as an individual to say that uh, the works that he did, I shall do also. Yes, I shall do also. And greater works than, than he shall, shall I do. Well, I understand. But Jesus was the head. He was the body in this earth. Now, he's still the head, but now we become the body. You understand? The head and the body were both together on the earth. Not omnipresent at one place at one time. Now he's still the head of the church. He, he was the fullness of the Godhead bodily walking on the earth. But now he went away, sent the Holy Spirit to us as we talked about. Now the body is operating in the earth with the same spirit of God that Jesus operated with is in the earth. And we can do what he did. And as a body, as the body, we ought to, we're going to do greater. We ought to do more and everything else. Amen. As an individual... Can you imagine everything be dependent upon you as an individual? But as a body, look what we're able to do. Everywhere at the same time. Everywhere at the same time. That means in all the countries on the continent of Africa and all the other continents and in America and North America, South America, Central America, all over the world right now, we're able to do the works of him every moment of the day. That's what's so powerful about it. See, when Jesus was in one place, he wasn't in the other places. When he was on this side of Galilee, the reason why he said, after one place, he said, uh, 
in Mark chapter four, after preaching, he said, they got into the ship, went to the other side. That's when he went with them. And the Bible said there was also with him other little ships. While they were heading to the other side, he was uh, asleep on a pillow and the and, uh, storm came. They wake him and said, Lord, don't you care that we perish? He rose and, re, you know, re, rebuked the wind, said to the sea, you know, peace be still and, and everything like that. But then they went to the other side. As soon as they got to the other side, there was a demoniac out of Daguerre that met them out of the tomb who cut himself and was naked and break the chains. And right after that, Jairus' daughter was healed. The woman with issue of blood was healed. But he had to get to the other side for them to get healed. Today, Shannon could be on one side of the lake, I could be on the other side of the lake and doing the miracles at the same time and never have to cross the lake. Because the body is active. I could be on the, I could be on the east side and Don could be on the west side. Shannon could be on the south side. Somebody could be on the north side of it and all doing miracles. And, and I wouldn't have to cross from the north to the south because he's already in the south doing it. You get it? So as the body will do more and greater than was ever done. But how did he do it? How did he do it? Let's go back and read the text that I started off with and go with me to uh, Acts chapter 10. Acts 10. Acts 10. And uh, Acts 10, 34. And Peter opened his mouth and said, in truth, I perceive God shows no partiality or he's no respect of persons. But in every nation, whoever fears him and works righteousness is accepted by him. The word which God sent to the children of Israel, preaching peace to, through Jesus Christ. He is Lord of all. That word you know which was proclaimed or published throughout all Judea and began from Galilee after the baptism which John preached. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power. How did Jesus do it? By the anointing of the Holy Ghost and with power. He did what? He went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. And we are witnesses of all things which he did, both in the land of the Jews and Jerusalem, whom they killed by hanging on a tree. So they're witnesses of all of these things. So how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power, who went about everywhere doing good. How many knows the anointing is there to do good? The anointing is always going to do good when it's in manifestation. The anointing of God lifts burdens and destroys yokes. When I preach on the anointing, I preach sometimes at times when I've done just the, just targeting on the anointing, I talk about what kind of yokes and what kind of burdens does this does this anointing really affect in people's lives? So when the anointing is in manifestation, yokes uh, burdens are lifted and yokes are destroyed. Somebody called me one day back in my office. If I say back in my office where the men's restroom is, you'd think my office is in the men's restroom. Prior to the men's restroom, prior to the crying room, was an office. It's been changed twice. I got a phone call one day from somebody that says, does this church believe in the supernatural? I said, oh, yes. Uh, and... Uh, and the more she talked, I'm thinking, uh, maybe I better find out what supernatural she's talking about. And when I started asking about the supernatural, the longer I talked, the weirder it got. And she was talking about manifestations of God that uh, I'm thinking, uh, that don't sound too much like God. I said, ma'am, I, I don't think I, the, the kind of manifestations that you're looking for, I don't think this is the place. Well, I'm sure it's not, very few churches even accept this. I'm thinking, that shows me there's more churches on target then. Uh, because, I mean, it got weird. And, uh, and so she started talking about the anointing and all of these things that were happening. And I'm thinking, uh, I said, okay, I got a question for you. And then she got into things uh, other than that. She got into things that I've heard, you know, they were in there and when they got done, there was, there was gold dust everywhere. And then they got in there where they were, there were dove feathers everywhere. And she said the anointing was so strong, the dove feathers were everywhere. 
And I'm thinking, well, Holy Ghost isn't a dove. He came as a form of a dove. You know, and it set up him like a dove. The way a dove would set up on you. And they had all of these things and uh, went on. I said, let me ask you a question. With all, the, with all the dove feathers and all the gold, I said, how many people got healed? Well, you ought to have seen the feathers. I don't talk about feathers. I want to know how many people got healed. How many people got delivered? But I'm telling you what, you could wipe the gold dust off people's foreheads. I don't, I'm asking you again. <laughs> How many people got delivered? She said, well, I, 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 I don't know. I couldn't tell you. I said, you think, did anybody shout, say I'm healed? I can see. I can hear. My leg grew out. My arm just grew out. My withered hands healed. No, I don't think anything. I said, ma'am, there's something in me that tells me when the anointing of God is in that kind of demonstration, if the power of God was that strong, the anointing of God was sent forth to lift burdens and to destroy yokes, not just to bring a sign, I was here. Well, I don't think, I don't think you believe. Good day. And, uh, but you know, people get weird. I've been saying this for weeks. You can be spiritual without being weird. It's true. You can be spiritual and walk with God. So I'm, I believe when the anointing of God is in full demonstration, burdens are lifted and yokes are destroyed. I'm not going to fuss over did they see dust, did they see, that's not, I wasn't there. But I do know if the anointing of God is that strong, Surely there's a burden in the house that's going to be lifted and surely there's a yoke that's going to be destroyed. Why would it be there? Jesus said the power of God was present to heal them. Present to heal them. Who's them? Them that were present before they took the roof off and lowered a man with the palsy down. He was present to heal them, but them didn't get healed because them didn't believe. Them was still, tie, still, still tied up trying to figure out how to frame him in his words. Amen. So Jesus went about doing good, went about doing good, healing all that so oppressed the devil for God was with him. Now go with me to John chapter 14. <clears throat> John chapter 14. How did Jesus do it? How did he do it? To do the works he did, we must do them the way he did them. Come on. You must do them the way he did them. That's not complicated. That is not complicated. So here we go. <clears throat> here we go. Uh, chapter 14, which let's just... Uh, this is a part here where he talks about he's the way, you know, he deals with being the way, the truth, and the life, uh, and uh, different things. I'm going to go away. My, in my father's house, there are many mansions, you know, we know that part. And, uh, but then, let's just look at, uh, I'll get, I guess we'll go to, just start at verse 9. I, if, not, I'll, if I don't watch it, I'll be going to let not your heart be troubled, verse 1. Uh, verse nine, have I been with you so long and yet have you not known me, Philip? He who has seen me has seen what? The father. Wow. You know, people say uh, uh, those who have seen me should see Jesus. He said, those who have seen me have seen the father. So how can you say show us the father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father in me? The works that I, the words that I speak to you, I do not speak on my own authority, my own accord, but the Father who dwells in me does the works. So he says, I do the works, these miracles, I do them because of the Father who's in me. Okay, if he does this, this by understanding the miracles that the father is in him, 
Shouldn't it become a revelation and a reality to us that Christ in us is the hope of glory, that we don't do it just because we have this notion that this is what a Christian does? If we do the things that we do by revelation, understand that the Father was in him, and now he is in us through the work of the Holy Spirit. The Spirit of who? The Spirit of God, the Spirit of the Father. He said, I do this. He said, I, I do it because I understand the Father in me. You know, if people really get an understanding that he dwells in me, I'm not only in Christ, but he's in me. 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 He is in me. I've walked and quoted that so many times. He's in me. He's in me. He is in me. He is in me. Oh, I am fully filled with God. That's when you heard me say, when I, when I got that in me one day, I said, I am wall to wall, Holy Ghost. Pastor Barkley says, God possessed. That's because when you're possessed, you're, co you're, totally, you're holy and totally taken over. There's some people have, talking about evil sides, some people have evil spirits that torment them, but they're not possessed. They're oppressed or tormented. But when somebody's possessed, another spirit has full control of them. So when you are full, when you are fully possessed of God, he has full control over you. So I'd say, I'm just, I'm wall to wall, God. I'm wall to wall, Holy Ghost. The works, the works that Jesus did, he did it because the Father was, was in him. The works that I do is because Jesus Christ is in me through the Holy Ghost. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power who went about doing good. I'll go about doing good because the Father is in me by his Spirit. Amen. Jesus said, I, the Bible said he is the very image of the Godhead bodily. And if Christ is in me, then the spirit is in me and the spirit of the father is in me. That's all one. You, you can't have one without the other. You can't have one without the other. I was teaching the uh, dog class that brother Don teaches and I kept them back there. Now you see where all you guys are kind of congregated back there. That's how the class was. Uh, I didn't stand up here and there was about one, looked like a, uh, you know, hopscotch group, you know, two, one, two, one there, but we were all back here and I had a little podium here, about right here. This is about the, this is about the size it was. And I was talking about prayer and the name of Jesus. And one person towards the back of the class one day says, uh, uh, I know I, I, I get confused on how to pray. I know how to pray the name of Jesus. I know how to pray the Father. I just don't know how to pray the Spirit. Well, I didn't know what that meant. I mean, you don't understand how to pray in the Spirit? No, you know, because here's, here's the layer that I talk about. We know, Jesus, that I didn't come to speak of myself, but I come to speak of him who sent me. You remember that? Uh, so uh, he, then he says, so J Jesus said that about, about the Father. I don't come to speak of my own, but the Father... It's, I speak what the Father tells me to say. In essence, he said, I only, do what I, I only say what I hear the Father say. I only do what I see the Father do. But then Jesus says, when the Spirit of God comes, he will not speak on his own accord, but he will reveal to you the things that, that God has showed me. So there is this thing. I've met a lot of people that uh, says, you know, I can pray to the Father in the name of Jesus, but, uh, but we can't pray and honor the Holy Spirit because it says when he comes, he will not speak of himself. He, he didn't come to glorify himself, but to glorify Jesus. And this person came out of that and got really confused. I said, let me, let me explain something. We are considered as Trinitarians. That means we believe God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Ghost. I said, this is why I believe it. I believe that before Jesus ever had the name Jesus, he was called the Word. 
The Bible says there's three that bear record in heaven. Before, in the beginning, three that bear record in heaven. The Father, the Word, and the Spirit. That's the three. Then it says, John said, there's three that bore witness in the earth. So there's three that bear records in heaven. John also said, by dealing with the, dealing with the deity of Jesus Christ, he said, in the beginning was what? The Word. The Word was with God and the word was God. So the word was what? With God. And was the word related to God or was God? The word not only was with God, he wasn't related to God. The, word said the, Bible, the Bible said the word was with God and the word was God. Okay, so then it says the word became flesh or God took up on flesh. If the word was God, God took up on flesh. A woman incubated that word. Birth came and God gave him a name, Jesus. All right. So that's what I said, that in the beginning was the word. People said Jesus was there from the very beginning. No, the word was. Jesus was birthed into the earth as God, but yet man. Why? Man lost the lease by the fall of Adam. Natural man lost the lease by fall. And for God to get it back, a man had to come into this earth by a natural means, not by the blood of man, not by the DNA of man, so that he would have the legal right to take back what man lost to begin with. So that's kind of how this thing worked. So when they said that, I said, ma'am, uh, what are you trying to say? So I got her to more questions. She says, well, I, I know it's all right to pray to Jesus, and I know it's all right to pray to the Father. I just don't know if it's all right to pray to the Holy Spirit. That's what I'm talking about. I said, listen, I cannot worship God without the Spirit and Jesus being present. And I can't worship Jesus without the Father and the Spirit being present. And I can't honor the Holy Spirit without Jesus and the Father being present because the three are one. Don't allow yourself to get so wrapped up on, oh my God, I can't do this, but I can do that. You're gonna mess with your faith and you're not gonna get any answers. Don't do that. I can't worship, I can't worship the Father without, the, without Jesus and without the Holy Spirit being present because the three are one. I, I, can't, I can't say, Father, I thank you for the whole, I say it, Father, I thank you for the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, I thank you for being you. I thank you for leading me. I thank you for guiding me. I thank you when I don't know how to pray. You pray through me. The Spirit of prays through me. I thank you that, that you will show me and enlighten my path. I thank you that I don't walk in darkness because you're there. I thank you, Holy Spirit, for being God that knows all things in my life. And I'll go back. Thank you, Father, for the Holy Ghost. Thank you for Jesus Christ. Thank you. No, I don't get confused because, because I don't try to just set a bunch of rules about it. When I love on one, they're all there. Come on. But there are some things you understand. When you pray, you pray to the Father through the name of Jesus. There, there, there is a there is a chain of command here. But I tell people, when you don't know what else to say, just say Jesus. Because when you said that name, you said it all. There's no way to argue it. When you said it, you said it all. I don't have to say, devil, come out in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. No, come out in the name of Jesus. Because when I said that name, I said it all. He knows. Come on. But I'm believing God for something, Father. I thank you. I thank you in the name of Jesus that the word of God that says I'm healed, I'm healed. I thank you that the word of God says I'm delivered, I'm delivered. I thank you for that. And I think sometimes people complicate life, complicate. They want to do the works of God. They want to they live and move and have their being in them, but they, get, they, they, allow, they allow things to complicate them. 
Don't allow life to complicate you. Don't allow it to complicate you. I remember when the book came out by Benny Hinn, Good Morning, Holy Spirit. I knew knew personally preachers that had a great struggle with it because you shouldn't say Good Morning, Holy Spirit. You should say Good Morning, Father, in the name of Jesus. People got goofy. Now, I don't know what all, I don't remember what the book was. I, I don't remember, I don't know if I ever read the book, be honest with you. I have the book. I'm sure I read excerpts out of it, but I don't know if I read it. If I did, I can't remember what's in it. Now, what I do know is the Bible says, don't offend the Holy Spirit. It's the Spirit of God. Don't grieve the Spirit. And I'm surely, I'm surely not going to blaspheme him. That's taking it to the final level. But if I know I miss the Holy Spirit, or let me just say this way, if, if, I, if we say, I just don't want to miss Jesus, I don't want to miss God. So let's maybe just say it this way. If I know I missed Holy Spirit, not just the Holy Spirit, if I believe I missed Holy Spirit on something, do you know what I do because I don't want to grieve him? I have fallen down. I said, Holy Spirit, you were sent to lead me and guide me. You were sent. It's you. It's the gifts of the Spirit that helps me do this. I, I, I'm sorry that, that I, I, I didn't. I missed that. I'm sorry. There's nothing wrong with that. Well, it's going to keep me right. It's going to keep me right with God. You understand? So Jesus said, the works that I do, I do because the Father's in me. If you're gonna do the works of Jesus, you gotta understand you're gonna do it because the Father's in you, but but he's in us now. Jesus, I'm gonna go away. Jesus said, the Father is in me. I'm gonna go away and I'm gonna send the other comforter to be in you. But just because the Holy Ghost is in us, the Bible still said Christ in us, the hope of glory. So if you have one, let me tell you what, you have it all. You have it all inside of you. I mean, just keep it simple. You have, people said God dwells in you. God dwells in you. Well, how's he dwell in you? By his spirit. Jesus, people, we tell our kids, what'd you do? I asked Jesus into my heart. How many's ever said it? You asked Jesus into your heart. Well, who came in, Jesus or the Holy Spirit? See, we don't, don't complicate it. Am I making sense? Don't complicate it. We have him in us. And the more you're aware of his presence, his presence in you, the more you're aware of that. When I stretch forth my hands, it's not me stretching forth my hands. The apostle said in Acts chapter four, praying after they were threatened and commanded not to speak no more in that name. And they prayed they got back, said they returned to their own company and prayed. And they said, God, grant unto, us, grant unto us with all boldness that we may speak thy word with boldness. By stretching forth thy hand to heal. Well, they know it's their natural hand. By stretching forth thy hand to heal that signs and wonders may be done by the holy child Jesus. Well, it wasn't the child Jesus that did it, but that's how, they, that's how the Bible quotes it. So the truth is, even though it was Peter and John's hand at that gate of the temple, that's what they was in question about the lame man. It was Peter and John's hand. It was Peter reached down and grabbed him, but he had an understanding. It was Christ in him that did the work. There's something about just that simple thing, I believe. If you understand what Jesus understood, I believe you can get the results that he got. It's that simple thing, Christ in me. Christ in me, the hope of glory. If Christ is in me, God's spirit's in me, when it's all wrapped up, let's just use Pastor Barclay's phrase, we're God possessed then. We are full of God. Have you ever said that to somebody? That person's full of God. They're just so full of God's love. They're so full of God's love. Well, well, who was God's love? Jesus, the Bible says, God is love and and, God. for love so loved the world that love sent his only begotten son. What he sent? Love. It's all, I mean, this thing is just all one. 
together. Let's just keep it where it's usable. Let's make it workable. I tell people this is a, don't just have a knowledge of God, have a working knowledge of God. Have a working knowledge of God. I mean, I've preached, I started preaching a bunch of churches that were in the IMA, International Ministerial Association, that were, that were oneness. That were oneness. Well, how did you preach in oneness? The same way I preach in threeness. The same way I preach in two-ness. The same way I preach in all of them. Because I have an understanding that it's Jesus Christ and him crucified that does it. It's the name. It's, he said it's a name and faith in that name that caused this man to walk. Yeah. I did, I did, I did revival meetings. I, I didn't realize it was uh, UPC until after I got started in it. But they were oneness. This one man that was Trinitarian, he said, my wife's a oneness preacher. I said, oh, she is. I said, yeah, I'm the, I'm the only one she preaches to. I said, that's a pretty good one, old boy. How many's wife, how many's got a oneness preacher? Oh, no, sorry. Uh, so, some of you ladies resemble that doctrine. But anyway, he did it by understanding the father in him. All right. Let's move on to one more. Let's look at verse. Let's, let's go on down to about verse. Uh, where are we at? Uh, we stopped at 10. And uh, verse 11. Believe me that I am in the father and the father in me. Or else believe me for the sake of the works themselves. Most assuredly, surely, surely, verily, verily, listen, hearken. I say to you, he who believes in me the works that I do, he will do also. And greater works than he shall he do because I go to the Father. Now he said, when I go to the Father, I'm going to send what? The comfort of the Holy Spirit. So what we're going to be able to do is do all of this through the power of the Spirit. And whatever you ask in my name, that I will do that the Father may be glorified. Now you ask in my name. The Spirit of God's in us. We're going to ask in his name and the Father's going to rejoice over it. So number one, you've got to get a revelation of who's in you. You've got to get a revelation who's in you. Number two, you've got to get a revelation of asking in the name of Jesus. It's that, it's that name. It's in that name. It's in that name. It's in that name. In that name. I talked about it before. I shared. The last time I shared was when I did that meeting last month with the Zambian, with the, actually, the meeting was held in Zambia. People came from Mozambique. Uh, they came from uh, Malawi and the Congo and Zambia. So we did that. But I shared here because I believe it's the thing that really brought understanding. Uh, back in 1985, I really started getting understanding about praying the name of Jesus and praying in the name. And, and so then I heard the word, I heard the word talked about that we use the name of Jesus like we use the power of attorney. We use the name of Jesus like using the power of attorney. And the power of attorney means that, uh, so angel has the power of attorney. Uh, we did that years ago. Uh, if I ever got caught overseas or something ever happened, things work, things didn't work out or whatever it was at that time, she could, she has a legal right through a document by the lawyer wrote up that she could stand and sign my name as if I'm still there. That's the power of attorney. And so when I went to the lawyer down here, matter of fact, it was, uh, Mr. Petrie down here in town years ago. This like 96. This was like uh, 95, 96, somewhere like that, don't matter. 95. Uh, I went down there and said, I'd like to have a power of attorney. I got some documents coming in. It was a check. 
it was a workman's comp settlement thing. And I said, I need Angel to be able to sign this and deposit and pay off some, pay off some debt, you know, to help improve my portfolio. Got to pay off that debt. And uh, he said, what kind of power of attorney do you want? I said, I didn't know, but there's only one. He said, oh, no, it could be at different levels. He said, you could give her power of attorney today to just sign that one document, and she has no more power of attorney at all. She could come in there and say, I want to sign his name, but the document only says from this date to that date, and she don't have a power of attorney. Or you could give her enough power of attorney to secure you a lawyer, professional advice. Or you could give her enough power of attorney where she could have you committed. I said, let's just go a little below that. <laughs> and, uh, but he gave me all of those scenarios. And I'm thinking, wow. God didn't just give us a temporary power of attorney through the name of Jesus. He gave it all. Right. He gave it all. He said, matter of fact, when you come together in my name, it's as if I'm standing there. So quit looking at your own inabilities. Quit looking at your own lack. Quit looking at your lack of understanding. And, and, uh, and uh, I don't know if God will ever use me. It's not you anyway. When you come in my name, I'm present. Amen. Just use it. I'm there. But notice how many people struggle with that because we say, I don't know if I lay hands on him. I don't know if it's going to happen. I don't see where Jesus struggled with that. And I don't believe he laid hands on everybody either. It's just my personal belief. Oh, why, do you, why, don't, well, why, why don't you believe that? Because I believe the day, which was recorded one of the days, he went to the pool of Shalom. And, uh, and there was many people there sick, but only healed one. Well, one was documented. He may have healed more, but... He didn't have any problem to say that there was a great multitude and he saw them as sheep having a sheep without a shepherd and he healed all their sick. He didn't have a problem saying he healed them all that day. But that particular day, there was one that he healed. There was one that he healed. Matter of fact, if you read the book of Mark in the first couple chapters, uh, especially I think chapter two, then chapter one, chapter two, it talks about Peter's wife being sick of the fever. And uh, Jesus came and laid hands on her. And it said, and people gathered at the door, the whole city gathered at the door to him. And he said, it, the Bible said, and he cast out many devils and healed many of the sick. It didn't say he healed all of them. Matter of fact, at one place, and we'll find out in my, my notes here, I got it recorded. It said in his own town, there he could do no mighty works except lay hands on a few sick folks. So the one part of how he healed was laying on hands. We're going to talk about it, and I'll read those verses in that. He said, so it didn't say he would not. It said he could not. So the doubt and unbelief hindered him from being able to heal. One person he healed, he took outside the city, and he laid hands on him and healed him. So sometimes... Uh, you're not going to get everyone healed. And you're surely not going to be able to lay hands on everyone. You're surely not going to be able to lay hands on everybody. I've been in revival meetings where I knew in my heart, as soon as I stood in front of someone, I knew in my heart that, and I know your mind's not going to understand this. You'll believe me, but you're, it's going to be hard to grasp. I knew in my heart that uh, laying hands on that person was not going to make a bit of difference. I should have just said, I'm not going to pray for you. But you know what that looks like for a guest to come in and say, I'm not going to pray for you? So I laid hands on them and there was no anointing at all. Zero. Zero. No virtue. No anointing. You pray. You use the word mercy, but there's no anointing. There's no anointing. I don't know why. I don't know what was in their life that, that hindered that. I don't know what was in their life that prevented that. But I knew as soon as I stood before them, there was none at all. Well, how often does that happen? I can count on two fingers probably uh, when that's happened. But it's happened. It's happened. So... 
and whatsoever you ask in my name, that I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. Now, that I may do. Now, he's talking to his disciples, but yet at chapter 14 is towards the last day before he's ready to be. We talked about chapter 13, 14, 15, 16, and 17. We know he's in the last hours here, so he knows he's going to go away, but he says, I'm going to do it. But he just getting ready to tell them in a little bit in the same prayer, the same meeting they were in. This is not the next day later, the same meeting. He says, now, I'm going to go away because I have many things to say to you and you can't get it. But when I go, he will come and he will reveal unto you you and you're going to do this by how I did it by being anointed of the Holy Ghost be anointed of the Holy Ghost so <clears throat> you're going to do this through the name of Jesus if you ask anything 14 if you ask anything in my name I will do it you know what that represents to me his total lordship whatever you ask in my name I'll do it you know that's hard too for people to grasp. Even I, I had a, I mean, I had a hard time wrapping my mind around that. We ask anything in His name, He does it. Whatever we ask in His name, He does it. Whatever we ask in His name, you know how many times we've prayed in His name and nothing happened. You know how many times people called me and said, "I've prayed and prayed and prayed, and nothing's happened. I don't know what to do." And discouragement and hope deferred makes the heart sick, and people walking around with a sick heart. But Jesus said, "Whatever you ask in My name, it shall be done." Folks, I really believe my heart, myself included. I remember the time that God dealt with me about, about building myself up on healing and I didn't do it. I was so busy preaching. About four weeks later, I got just, I mean, side slammed, T-bone, so to speak. Something hit my body and I had to get out of guilt. I had to get out of this this guilt like it's my fault my fault my fault in essence it was I'm thinking if I just would have yielded to him and listened to him I could have prevented this but I didn't do it because he's out to protect us to help us to guide us he gave the spirit of God to lead us and guide us I'll never forget that and I'll never forget it we're sitting in the family room when the first house Angel and I bought and we were watching some conference on television, you know, it wasn't a live thing. And, and I was doing that and I heard inside, uh, build yourself up on healing. Well, I almost, in, well, not almost interpreted as, you know, start studying it. So, uh, I'm going to use you more, but I, I misinterpreted it. He meant build yourself up on it. Get yourself built back up in it for you. And preachers can miss it quicker than any of us because when God speaks to us, our first reaction is, who's it for? Where do you want me to preach it? Who do you want me to tell it to? And the thing is, we have to look at ourselves quickly. This for me? Yes, it's for you, Captain Obvious. It is for you. And I misinterpreted it. Where am I going? I guess I'm going to preach healing at my next meeting. No. No, he wanted me to get built up so when this thing hit my body, I could dismiss it quickly. But this thing liked to knock me off my feet. It liked to knock me off my feet. So we have to continue to build ourselves up. So say with me, I'm going to do the works of Jesus because he dwells in me. The spirit of God dwells in me. I'm going to do the works of Jesus because I have his name. This is what, this is what we're going to do. We're going to do it because we have his name. And uh, once you understand that if we do what he did and did it the way he did it, we can get the results that he got. Amen. And, uh, this is not just how you get healed as much as what I'm talking about is how you help others. How you help others. God, I believe others are needing help. And you've got to know how to get this done. You've got to know how to open people's heart for this. In verse 14, I added in there, if you ask anything in my name, I will do it. And I wrote down in my Bible, he is Lord. He is Lord. I will do it. What makes you think you can do it? Because I'm Lord. Why would you do it? Because I'm Lord. 
I'm master. I'm ruler. The word created what? Everything. John said everything is created was created by him. Everything was created by him. Everything, everything. He was the, he was the spoken word. He's the living word, the bread of life. And that word has creative power in everything because he's Lord over everything. He's your Lord, he's my Lord. And if he's not your Lord, then you need to get, you need to make sure you understand lordship because when he's Lord, he's boss. When he's Lord, he's master. When he's Lord, he's more than enough. So don't try to be your own Lord. Don't try to be your own Lord. Don't try to be your own Lord. You let him be Lord of all. Amen. All right. It's quarter after. Let's stand. I'll let you, uh, uh, we'll go ahead and get on, quit on time this week.